Good to have you here tonight. We're gonna have fun, fun, fun. Elsa, welcome. York, welcome. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hey, hey Dan. Yes, sir. Hey. Wow. Welcome. Hey. Thank you. Tonight we're gonna to do a math review. Math, let's see, math review. <laughs> we're gonna do a little board work. Want to compliment all of you. I've spoken with some of you privately, and uh, those that have called in, you've shared with me the higher math classes you've had, like trigonometry and advanced calculus and uh, advanced algebra. These are going to be very helpful to you uh, in the real estate exam that you've had these higher math classes. And no, that was a lie. <laughs> Look, folks, you don't need higher math classes to get through the real estate exam. In fact, I even hesitate calling it math because what it really is is just arithmetic. You can do everything you need to know and, and use on the math. It, it, you got to have a feeling for the formulas. But guys, it is all addition, multiplication, division, and this one, takeaway or subtraction, that's it. And you can use a calculator as well. Now, you don't need an amortizing calculator like, like mine that I use, but you know this is what I use and this is what I like using, but because they probably won't even let you use your own calculator <laughs> anymore. They, you know, they're afraid you had the math crib sheet rolled up on the battery pouch or something you're going to pull it out but so um, there is a, a, a calculator that does all these functions as you need here on the computer itself and you can use that one uh, but if you you know if you beg them they they have a few there at at the the center that they'll lend you uh, that you can use as well and I, I you know i would advise you to do that you know try try to beg one out of them if if, if they have one, okay? Now, as we begin tonight, uh, you can see on the screen that Dan just uh, uh, lets you know that, you know, in, in Dropbox, you, you can uh, download the questions. And as we wrap up this evening, we're actually going to send you a list of all the formulas we're using, uh, as well as a sheet that shows you how to get the answers, you know, to all the questions tonight. Fair enough? Okay, cool. So let's, let's get started. So, we're going to start out with uh, property tax, and uh, there's several categories that that you're going to see, you know, the math questions in, and property tax is definitely one of them. And uh, we're going to work one or maybe two questions on some of these um, as as we go through here tonight. And uh, let, let me go ahead and read the property tax question for you, and then and then I'll tell you some of the tricks that they use, and then we'll actually work a problem together. Okay, so here here we go. M's home had an appraised value of $380,000, okay? So the appraised value was $380,000. Okay, that's not zero. And that was appraised value, okay? 380 grand was the appraised value, okay? The assessment rate is 60%. So we have the assessment I, I, <laughs> careful about abbreviating that one <laughs> i don't want to abbreviate that one assessment rate <laughs> thanks dan <laughs> was 60 percent right okay 60 percent now this is good information okay and the tax rate tax rate was seven mils okay tax rate was seven mils so what will a tax bill be at the end of the year? Now, as you look at these problems, and, and, and we have some better examples as we go through, because all the information they gave you in this question was actually useful. But a lot of times they'll throw in some ancillary uh, numbers that you don't need at all, and they'll just throw them in here to try to confuse you. But the, the key to unraveling this one is, first of all, you have to know 
the formula. And then two, you have to know what a mill is. Okay, so what is a mill? A mill is one tenth of a cent. So, you know, a penny is 0 0.01, right? I mean, you've seen that, you know, like, you know, $12 and a penny or whatever. But a mill is a tenth of a cent. So a mill is 0 0.001, and that is a mill. A mill is equal to 0 0.001. You have to know that. So what would 27 mills be? Angela, what would 27 mills be? This is your chance to participate. So what, what, what would it be? Point See, what? 27 mils, so it would be point two seven or zero point two seven. Ah, point zero two seven. Because one mil is point zero zero one. So if it's 27 mils, it'd be point zero two seven. Perfect. Thank you. So you have to know that. If you don't know that, you can't work the problem. So you have to know what a mill is. So write that down in your notes. One mill is equal to 0 0.001 or one tenth of a penny, one tenth of a cent. Okay. Mill, you know, is, is, is Latin and mill actually means like a thousand. So, you know, if, if you're familiar with that, but you don't need to know Latin, you don't need to know algebra, <laughs> you don't know any of that stuff. Okay. We got to work the problem. All right, so what happens is we, we needed that. And now we need the formula. And uh, the formula, you know, we're going to send this to you. But, but the formula is really quite simple. It is assessed value times the assessment rate gives you, uh, yeah, the assessed value times the rate gives you the assessed value in dollars, OK? times the tax rate gives you the tax due. And you'll, you'll get a copy of this. But you know, if one way to remember this, okay, you got the appraised, appraised value, uh, sorry, not assessment, okay, appraised value, and that's, what, that's appraised by the county assessor. You know, so sometimes called the assessed value, but you know, uh, but really, to get the assessed value, we need we need to to, to put the rate in there. So we you know we have the praise value by the by the who by the county assessor and times the assessment rate. You can write these down or not if you don't want to, uh, because um, you know we're 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 going to send them to you, or you know we're going to put them in the Dropbox so you can download them. And that will give you what is called uh, the assessed value, which, which is now. Let's look at our problem. Remember, I said the the home appraised at three hundred eighty thousand dollars, and I said the assessment rate was sixty percent. Now, this is another thing you need to know: if the assessment rate is sixty percent. Okay, you have to know how are you going to change the 60% into a decimal equivalent, you know, because uh, you, I don't want you to use your percent key on the calculator unless you do it all the time, because it'll mess you up. So we need to change this to its decimal equivalent, but it's really easy because, because the percentage sign has two zeros in it. So to change anything, if it was 60%, You'd start over here on the right side and you go one, two spaces to the left. So 0 0.60 is the same thing as 60%. Okay, so up here, uh, you know, on this formula, let, let, me, let me show you this formula one, one more time. You know, you noticed up here I wrote full house. Another way to remember this, if you're a poker player, is that you have you have the assessed value assessed assessment rate that gives you you know I'm sorry you have the appraised value times the assessment rate and that gives you the assessed value so that's three aces a a a and then down here that gives you the tax rate times the assessed value gives you the tax due then that's that's two tens so that's a full house aces over tens okay 
So, you know, that might help some of you if you're really into poker. But anyway, so what happens then is I messed this up to where I need a new sheet of paper. Here we go. Here we go. All right. So we have to figure this out. We had the appraised value, which is $380,000. Okay. And we're going to multiply that by 0. 0.60, which is the decimal equivalent of 60%. And that was the assessment rate. Now, if you're wondering what the assessment rate is, that's, it, it, it's kind of a thing for, uh, well, it's politics, okay? <laughs> so what it is, is that politicians have figured out that um, there are more people that own single family residences or a duplex that they live in or a fourplex, but it, there's more people that own residential real estate than own commercial real estate, you know, more voters. Okay, and so what they've done is they said, well, let's favor people, you know, we'll give them a break. If you live in your house, okay, or even if you rent it out to a long-term tenant, then we're not going to tax you on the full value. The full value appraised by the county assessor was 380. But we're not going to tax you on that, but we're going to mess with these. OK, so sometimes it'll go up, sometimes it'll go down, depending on the political climate and how much money they want to earn, you know, for the coffers of the government and, um, you know, what what the voting public is, is suffering. Now, some states like California, where they've had extreme value increases, like we're currently going through here, we might see it here someday. Um, they have locked in this value here for people that don't sell their house and aren't moving. You know, so like you're an, uh, you're an elderly person, you live in this house for 37, 47 years, and uh, it was, it was uh, uh, appraised at 380,000, you know, number of years ago. And, but, but, you know, it's near the beach now in California, so now it's worth, you know, a million three hundred and eighty thousand dollars you know. Um, you're not going to have to pay taxes on that high figure. The next person that buys the house... <laughs> They paid a million three eighty, and they're 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 going to get hit. So as long as you remain parked in your property in California, you didn't have to suffer these ever increasing tax rates as much. So that's one way they can do that is is by helping people here. But what we're doing in our state, in many most states, is that they messed with this. So they give you a break. So as long as you're living in your own house or you rent it out to someone else that's, you know, not, not an Airbnb, you know, I don't know, but they're, they're kind of flying under the radar a little bit there, but not probably not for long because they're, the, all the governments are looking for money. But this, this 60%, they give you a 40% discount because what you're going to do now in order to figure out how much the tax is going to be actually assessed on, we need to come up with the assessed value. And on this one, 60% uh, of this is going to be $228,000, okay? So we're gonna be taxed on this, not this, okay? And if the government wants to make some more money, they might kick this up to 70, so you only get a 30% discount. Now in Park City, where you are uh, renting out your home uh, through a lot of Airbnb. There are no permanent tenants there. And they can track this. You know, the assessor's office tracks all this. Um, you know, they watch rental ads. They, they look at all the Airbnb ads and they're tracking this. Uh, if if the, you don't have a long-term tenant in your property in Park City, they're going to tax you on the full amount. Okay. Because it's like it's like an apartment building, they're going to tax you on this. But if you can say, "Oh no, that's a long-term tenant, and you know he is, it, you know he's, he's signed a year lease or whatever," uh, then then you're going to get the discount. Or if you're if you're if it's your permanent re if your your personal principal residence. So here's the value you're going to get taxed on. And what was our tax rate? It was 27 mills, right? No, it was only. Was that the what was the mill levy? Ah, seven mills. So seven mills, oh, that's, 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 that's a pretty good deal. This is seven mills, isn't it? Okay. So 
like most, and so the answer to this is fifteen hundred and ninety six bucks. And uh, that is answer B, fifteen hundred ninety six bucks. Now, tricks. Not a lot, but one of the tricks is you have to know what a mill is. And what is a mill? 0 0.001. And 27 mills will be 0 0.027. Seven mills will be 0 0.007. Well, that's not a big deal. You can remember that, you know. And, and the other is you have to throw, you, you're not going to tax here, you're going to tax here. Okay. Now, this is a very straightforward problem because you start at the top and you work down, and there's your answer. Okay. And I love math on the test. You're only going to see about eight problems, maybe. It's not going to be that huge of a deal. And uh, there was no calculus here. There was no algebra here. It was just simple multiplication a couple of times. And there's, there's, there's your answer. However, what is just as common is they're going to work it backwards. <laughs> they're, instead of going from top to bottom, you're going to go from bottom to the top. And so they're going to give you this. Oh, the tax paid was this. Okay, the mill levy was this, the assessment rate was that. Well, if you're going from the top to bottom, it's going to be multiply, multiply. But if you're going from the bottom to the top, it's the same thing. You're just going to have to divide, divide. Okay, so you have this number, you divide it by that, and we give you this number. And you have this number, you divide it by that, and we give you that number. So either working it up or down, you can do this. You can do this. I know you can do this. It might take a little practice because most of us don't use that much math as we get, you know, out of high school and college. You know, we just don't. If you do, this is going to be no challenge for you uh, at all. In fact, your big complaint will not be the math. It'll be the lack of math. Ah, I wish they had more math. You know, they would have been great. But that's the way it goes. Okay, so that's the first answer if I'm at. Let's now talk about, a. and, and this was property tax, okay? Property tax, okay? Any questions on this? Questions? Comments? York, can you do this? You're all muted. Uh, you know, I'm pretty sure I could do this. I, I like how you explained uh, the division process. Okay, it, it works the same way. You put... See, on, on this, they're not going to give you this. See, on this problem, they gave you this, they gave you this, they gave you this, they gave you that, right? I mean, that was all in the stem of the question. And, and all you have to do is set it up correctly, and then you came up with this. But if it's working backwards, they're not going to give you this. They're going to say, this guy paid $1,596 in taxes last year. His mill levy was seven mills. His assessment rate was 60%. So you work it this way. You, you divide the one below the line by the one above the line. So you would take this number. If you have a calculator, go ahead and do it. 1596 and divide it by 0 0.007. And that will give you this number. And you take that number and divide it by 0 0.0 or 60, 0 0.60. And that would give you this number. Instead of this being the right answer, it would be this being the right answer. Got it? Great question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Let's, get another, let's do another exciting question. I'm going to have lots of paper. Okay. All right. So um, we're going to talk about cap rate. Now, cap rate uh, it goes by several disguises on the test, okay? <clears throat> I've seen it called capitalization rate, <coughs> which is not far off from cap rate. That's not that sneaky. I've seen it called capitalizing an income. But the biggest set of terms or, or the words that they're going to use to describe cap rate problems are rate of return, rate of return okay that's what they're going to call it on the tail uh, on the test more than cap rate but they could call it cap rate too but they're all the same it's the same formula the same thing let's go ahead and work one right now um 
Kay has an investment property that they would like to list. I love that. You know, they're going to list with you. This is great. This is, this is a good day. Any day you don't get a listing is a listless day. Um, they currently earn $10,000 a, a month in rent. Okay, so rent, 10,000 bucks. And what was that per what? Per month. Okay, and rent. Uh, expenses, they have expenses. You know, so they don't just keep Get, keep all the 10 grand, they got to pay expenses and expenses include five grand and maintenance to maintain, okay. Uh, also there's $300 in tenant improvements. Uh, that's called, you know, TI, tenant improvements. And um, they want, um, you know, they, they're, they're figuring the market right now is, is paying or demanding a 6% cap rate. Now, how would you know that the market is, is demanding or paying a 6% cap rate? In, in, in other words, investors would like to get the highest cap rate they, they can get. I want a 10% cap rate. It's better than a six, but you're not going to get it. Why? Because you have to pay more for the property. The more you pay for the property where the rents are kind of locked in here, the lower the cap rate. So what's happening in this market is it's kind of a seller's market because you're only going to get a 6% cap rate. Okay. And, and maybe that's pretty good. But how do you know if, if a 6% cap rate is good or not? You have to do some analysis. Or better yet, you have to develop a friendship with the appraiser <laughs> and take them to lunch. Now you don't have to take them to the really nice places. You know, I mean, you could take them to Wendy's, you know, ah, well, maybe, maybe I'll take them to Moochie's, but you could take them to, you know, because you don't have to take them to the, you know, the steakhouses, you know, and not, not the appraisers, you know? And so what happens here is you're gonna ask them, what's your typical cap rate on a duplex? What's your typical cap rate on a fourplex? On a single family that's rented for income, what are people getting for cap rates these days? And they know, you know, because they're working with it every single day. And once you develop a relationship with them, you don't have to take them to lunch. You just call them on the phone. You know, so, so you need to develop some of these friendships in the business just from a practical uh, standpoint so you can you know, kind of survive. But that's, how you, that's, how, that's the best way to do it, okay? It's just take an appraiser to lunch um, and uh, befriend them. You know, I mean, very few agents ever call them. I mean, uh, many of them would be uh, surprised, you know, because uh, you know, you're so friendly and you're so nice. You know, I mean, gosh, most agents hate us. You know, <laughs> they have a tough job anyway. So what happens here is um, there's some tricks to doing cap rate or rate of return analysis. Okay, here's the first one. This is important. Listen up. Cap rates are always Annual, 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 annual. Cap rates are always what? Annual, annual, annual. That's a hypnotic technique. So if I do this, you're supposed to say annual. You know, I mean, you could do that in the exam. Click your fingers and someone will say annual, you know, and then, uh, you know, then they'll get upset with you, but they were just in my class. Oh, well. So what happens is, the first trick they play with you is this was 10 grand per month. Now they didn't specify the five and three here, but if they didn't specify, then you, you can assume it was also monthly. Okay, so the first thing you have to do is you have to annualize everything. You have to annualize the income and you have to annualize expenses as well. Because the second trick to figuring cap rate is that cap rates are always, always, always not calculated on gross income. They are always calculated on NOI, or that's net operating income. This is the one. They're calculated on net operating income. Well, this is not net operating income. I told you right there in the question. Okay that they earn $10,000 per month in rent and the expenses. And they went on to calculate, you know, tell you what the expenses were. So this is not 
NOI. This is gross operating income. So we need to make this NOI. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, we've got to take that and we've got to take these away from that in order to come up with the NOI down here. Well, so let's figure that out. Let's go ahead and make this annual. So $10,000 times 12 months is going to be what, guys? I mean, it's real easy, right? 120,000 bucks. Or we could do it another way. Let me see. Should we do it that way? You might understand it better that way. Okay, let's take our 10 grand. We'll annualize the whole thing at the end. But understand, it's got to be annual. Okay, so, and we got to take off what? This 5,000 in maintenance. Now, five grand in maintenance a month, this building must be falling apart. <laughs> but that's okay. The questions on the exam don't have to have any basis in reality. But that's minus five grand because we were working for NOI, right? And then, uh, and then minus 300 in tenant improvements. You know, to have an ongoing tenant improvement of 300 is maybe a little unusual, but like I said, you know, it just does has nothing to do with uh, reality. So you take the 10 minus five would give you five and minus three would give you a total of 4,700 bucks, right? Did you see where I got that? Did you see where I got that 4,700 bucks? Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 10 grand minus the, uh, these were all in the stem of the question. The only trick here was we had to make them annual and, and we had to subtract them from the gross income in order to get NOI. So we got this, but the problem with this now is it's still not what? Still not annual. So we got to take that and multiply it by 12. And that's going to give us an annual income of 56 thousand dollars okay now we're still not done with the question because they want to know uh what we got to list it for in order for him uh you know to get i mean uh, the new buyer that's coming in you know to get a six six percent uh cap rate so what do we have to do well we found out that the cap rate for our market was how much six percent and you know all it did was you know cost us a, um you know big mac combo meal i mean it was per, per, per pretty good deal to get that information all right so but remember you we, we unless you're using your percent key which i don't want you to use uh we've got to turn this into a decimal equivalent but we know how to do that because there's two zeros here so we're going to take this 60 uh, 5600 we're going to divide that by point Oh, six. Because we're going to go one, two. And we're only going to have one zero in there. And that's going to give us our listing value. Put this on the market for uh, nine, nine, 940,000. And right there. Now, as long as that property, if you find a buyer that buys it for 940,000 and these figures are real, then you, that, that buyer is going to get a 6% rate of return, which is a lot better than you can get at the bank, you know, which is less than 1% rate of return. But there's some work involved here too. You know, the bank's very passive. Okay. And so that is uh, answer A. And that's how, that's how you get it. Okay. Questions on this one. That's your cap rate problem. And what are the tricks? Well, there's several. It's going to be called rate of return. It's going to, it, you're in, in the, these figures all have to be made what? Come on, man. Click it. Annual. Annual. Yeah. And then uh, we've got to do NOI. Okay. Now we have some math practice classes and, and sheets that you can get from the school. Uh, there are other videos other than this live session we're doing here tonight. Uh, where you can work several of these. And some of these, on this one, we were just working for the, the overall value of 940. <clears throat> but some of these, they may give you that value and you may have to do, instead of multiplication, you have to do division in order to come up with this cap rate. 
you know, similar to what, what we did in the last problem where, you know, if you go down, you multiply, but if you go up, you, uh, you divide. Okay. And remember, uh, and, and we, we will send you the formula. And on this one, when you send you the formula, there's actually three variations, depending on what you're trying to solve for. So it's, it's the same formula, but algebraically, you have to change it one way or another. Um, but you can just remember the formula and that'll help you there. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Now remember, the heavy math on all this is that you need a 70% to pass the exam. The math problems are going to be primarily on the national portion of the exam. There are some questions on the state portion that have figures in them, but they're really not as much of a calculation thing as it is, can you find this figure somewhere on a settlement sheet? Uh, and the question will be something like, uh, uh, was um, a home warranty provided uh, for the buyer on this transaction and how much was it and who paid for it? You know, so yeah, there's a $600 figure in there you have to find on a settlement sheet. You have to find out which column it's in. Is it, is it being charged to the buyer? Or is it being charged to the seller? Okay. So, you know, just because it had a number in it didn't mean it was a math problem. So the math problems are going to be mainly on the national portion of the test. And I already said earlier, you know, that, that uh, there's probably only going to be eight. And the whole uh, portion of the test is, you know, I mean, it's, it's only going to be 80 questions total. Oops, that's not my calculator. <laughs> that was my fault. I guess I had a calculator on it. All right. So if we have 80 questions, folks, and you only need a 70%, that means... <laughs> you could miss 30%. So let's take 80 questions and let's multiply that by uh, 30. And that, that means you can miss 24 questions. So you could miss every single math question and still have another 16 you could miss. <laughs> but I like math. You know, I think you ought to know how to do some of this stuff. This last question we just did has a practical application. I mean, if you're sitting down and someone has an investment type property, it's a duplex or, and, and, or fourplex, and then here's the income and what should I, you know, list, you know, what would I have to list it for in order for, you know, well, right now, duplexes are getting about 6%. I mean, how did you know that? Well, you took the appraiser to lunch before you went on your listing presentation or you called them on the phone, you know, because they have the up-to-date knowledge on what's exactly happening in the market. You can ask people in the office and stuff, but, you know, Crap, they don't know. The appraiser knows. <laughs> so that's 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 where you need to go, right? Go to the appraiser. All right, let's go to the next question. This question is about area, you know, surface area. Okay. All right. The question says F is building a new home. Cool. <coughs> and I, you know, I like people who are building new homes. I, you know, I. Listings are hard to get right now, and you know because things are selling so fast that anybody can sell it. And you know, but but people are confused. There's still a ton of paperwork, and they still would like the help of a professional. And many of them will list. So one source of listings you might consider are people that are building a new home, like this guy. He's building a new home. So, and this is a pretty nice home. I mean, this is a big one. Okay, so they build big thousand homes. I mean, I <laughs> they build big homes like eight thousand square feet and above. Um, they're going to sell their big house that they're currently in and move into a tiny apartment, or move in with their kids, and then build their next mansion. Does that sound logical to you, Esther? Probably not. I mean, crap. You know, I mean, the payments are only like 6,000 a month. What's the big deal? <laughs> we're going to live in our existing really big home. Okay. And we're going to build the really bigger home. <laughs> and then when we're finished, we're going to put the one we're living in after we moved into the new one, because we don't want to be inconvenienced by people tromping through our house. We'll sell it empty or we'll have an agent stage. It. So what, 
what am I getting at here? I had a really great listing by a motivated seller. Find someone that's building a new home and then tell them how wonderful it is and how cool it is and how you're doing it and it's really neat. And uh, what are you going to do if you're old home? Oh, well, as soon as we get the new one done, we're going to put it on the market. You know, things are selling so fast now. We'll just move into it and we'll sell it and, and say, oh, well, hey, you know, and then uh, could I come over and look at it? You know, I mean, wouldn't it be better that the very day you move out after we get it clean that, you know, we have it ready to go? I mean, start start working with them. Well, normally we list with Susie Sweetie over here. She's fantastic. Uh, oh, yeah, but would you be offended if I came by and looked at it and brought you a buyer? You know, I mean, she doesn't have it listed yet. They haven't listed it yet. So uh, you could slip in there with a the buyer right at the right time, and that's how you could make a, a thirty thousand dollar commission. Okay, I mean you have to be aggressive and you have to work what works, and that's something that's worked for me more than once. <laughs> I bought several new cars with that. Okay, anyway, let's talk about area. F is building a new home, and they have uh, laid out the foundation, which is thirty yards by by fifteen yards. Okay, so we got. 30 yards, how do you do that? Is it yards? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, we'll just do this. By 15 yards, they are, yes, okay. And uh, two stories, it's a, it's a two story. So this whole thing is gonna have a bottom level and a top level, so there's gonna be two levels. And uh, they're gonna have 10, 10 foot vaulted ceilings course it's going to be a really you know it's done by a local architect or maybe even you know even a major architect from you know la or something uh, so how many square feet of living space are they going to have now this is one of those questions i was mentioning earlier where they're going to give you more information than you need when you're doing the square footage of a house first of all we're not talking about yards and we don't care how high the ceilings are, okay? That's not gonna influence the square footage. It's gonna make a much cooler house, particularly if you have high basement ceilings. 10 foot ceilings in a basement is way cool. Uh, usually, if, you know, you can have a situation where you have you know, much bigger windows down there, brings in a little, little bit more light and you go down there and it feels like, wow, this is like another whole house down here. It's beautiful. Yeah, well, it, it's because the high ceilings make it feel better. And you can do some really cool things with the sheetrock in there and have coffered ceilings, all kinds of cool stuff. But, um, but we don't need this 10 foot vaulted ceilings. I mean, we're looking for the square footage. The question asks us, uh, how many square feet of living space will they have? Okay, all right, so we don't need that. Now, the second trick here is we're, you know, in the, in the question, they're asking how many square feet of living space? So, you know what a yardstick looks like. How many yards are, how many feet are in a yardstick? There's three. So you don't use these numbers, you're going to get confused. You take these numbers and we're going to multiply them by three. Why three? Why are we going to go three times this and three times that? Because our final answer is going to be in square feet. So let's convert it right now so that we, when we look down at that A, B, C, and D answer, we're going to have something that's, uh, you know, that actually works. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take, we're going to take, um, this is going to, this is going to come out to be 90 and this is going to come out to be 45 and we're going to multiply length times width and that's going to give us our, uh, our area of 4,050 square. This is how you do square feet. That means square feet. Okay. But is that our answer? No, because remember, it's a two story. So assuming that, you know, there's no cantilevers or anything, I mean, you know, that they, look, they can't make all these questions that specific. So if they didn't say there were cantilevers, that's, that, that's where the, the top floor sticks out in places that are like two feet, you know, overhang of the lower level. But they didn't tell you there was any cantilevers. So, you know, we figure there aren't any. So we're going to multiply this by two because it's a two story. This is a nice house. This is this is big, man. Eight eighty one hundred square feet, right? Yeah, eighty one hundred square feet. It's a nice house. I don't know what they're living in, but it was probably five to six thousand square feet or so. Cool. 
I would like to have sold them the lot, which is another way to tie these people to you. Oh, we're looking for a lot to build our beautiful custom home on. We just can't find one. If you found them a lot, there's a chance you might get a piece of that new house because you could find them a builder too. And there's a real good chance you're gonna get their older house. This, this, this could be like a year's worth of income on your former job. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, I'm not getting giddy. I'm just getting excited for you because the potential in this business. Wow. You could build a family legacy with all this stuff. All right, so questions on this one. Length times width, that's the formula. Hey. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. I have a question. Why do you uh, multiply it by three on the 30th? And the because 15th? this was yards. Okay. Okay, and there's more feet there's three feet in every yard oh i see okay okay they the, the question asks you what is the square foot edge not the square yard ish see that's a trick okay. so you got to know you got to convert this to feet great question okay, thank, thank, you. thank you no thank you <laughs> hey i don't know what i'd do on tuesday nights if i didn't get to come talk to you guys once in a while Thanks, Dan. <laughs> it's fun. It's fun to talk about this stuff. Oh, that's it. all right. So let's do our. Oh, that's the answer. So we'll do that. go back to our next question. All right, our next question is loan to value ratio. Loan to value ratio. Something lenders are really concerned about. Loan to value ratio. Right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Now, <clears throat> if a lender said, how much is that house you want to buy? And you said 400,000. Okay. I'll tell you what, um, I'll lend you 400,000. Then you would have to put down no down payment, right? Right. Okay. Now you're still going to have some closing costs, you know, I mean, doc fees and, and recording fees and uh, lender fees and more fees and other fees. <laughs> you're still going to have some closing costs, but you have no down payment. So the loan to value ratio on that loan. Oh, thank you, grandpa. <laughs> because the loan to value ratio on that loan was a hundred percent because you borrowed the, the, all the money you needed to pay for the house. There's still going to be some recording fees and things like that. And those fees usually run around one and a half, one, well, almost, you, you can figure on 2% is, is realistic. Um, so uh, that'd be 100% loan to value ratio. But unless it is grandpa, probably nobody is going to lend you 100%. Now, if you're a veteran and you served our nation and, and uh, put your life on the line and Thank you very much for your service. Uh, part of the benefit you get is you can get a, um, a VA loan, which will lend you 100%. And there's some other things that go with that. And there's, but, um, but there are 100% loans out there. And sometimes you can get owners to carry back 20 or 30% and a lender will lend you the balance, which would be, you know, 80 to 70% with whatever that, you know, you got the seller to carry back. And that sometimes you can, with creative finance, you can get a 100% loan. Sometimes you get a 110% loan, uh, but not too often. And in this market, uh, most lenders are not going to do that because they're all wigged out about the prices and everything else. So here's the question. H bought a home for $200,000 with a down payment of $30,000 and has been making on the properties for 10 years. Now, 10 years later, their property has appreciated in value by 30%. <laughs> it's like two good years in Utah. <laughs> Ugh, it's crazy right now. Uh, and their current loan balance is $117,000. Okay. What is their current loan to value ratio? Okay. All right. So they paid a couple of hundred grand for this house. 
we're 10 years down the road, okay? And they figure their houses were 30% more, 30% increase. We want an end, they paid 10 years on the loan. Now, loans are done on what they call a amortized basis. And in the beginning years, you pay less on the principal and more on the interest because, but you do pay a little on the principal and over a 10 year period of time that each month that goes up because it's retiring the loan. And so what happens is um, your equity position actually gets better as the loan is older. You know, because you paid off a little bit on that principal. So some of that principal is, um, is being paid off. Um, so they put down 30,000. I'm not going to put that up here. Uh, but, but their current loan balance is 117,000. Okay. So what we want to know is what is their current, their current loan to value ratio. Now, if they pay 200,000 for it and they put down 30%, then their loan to value ratio on this home when they bought it was what? 70%. If all of it's 100% and they put down 30%, then their loan to value ratio was 70% when they first bought it, when they first bought it, okay? So their loan was, uh, $140,000 to begin with. So they paid off, you know, about 30, uh, about $33,000 or $23,000 in principal. Somewhere in there. So, you know, that's, that's been pretty, pretty good. Um, but still, we want that, that's all history. What we want to know now is what is their current loan to value ratio? Okay, well, to figure that out, first we need to know what their current value is of the home. Well, if this is what they paid for it, but they had an increase of what? 30%, then uh, what would that, that new value be on that home right now? Well, I mean, you know, we, we're, we're gonna take the 200,000, we're gonna multiply that by 130. Now, why the percent? Why? Because if it had an increase in value, okay, then if it, if it did go up, then it's all of this, isn't it? It's all the 200 grand. That's 100% of what they paid for it. Plus they had an increase of 30%. So this has to be added to what this was, which was 100%. And that's where we got the 130%. Questions on that? Now, what if the market had actually gone down? What if it had lost 30%? What is our current loan to value ratio? Well, if it lost 30%, then are they gonna get this all back? No. So you would figure out how much 30% of this was, that'd be 60,000. The house today would only be worth $140,000, you know, cause they've lost money. You don't always win in real estate. Sometimes you lose, not, not that often. And if you're careful about where you buy and how much you buy, but on high end homes, you know, uh, just two years ago, uh, you could buy a beautiful home, you know, a million, two million five, and it was costing 200,000 to build that thing. You know, I mean, so, you know, that it, it was pretty grim. Now that's changed with everything else, but, but so we're going to take uh, this and we're going to multiply it by that. Why? Because we want to know what it's worth today. And so we're going to do that. And we're going to come up with the current value of $260,000. You see where I got that? I took this times that. Now the current value is $260,000. We need to know that because we know the current loan is $117,000. Okay. Okay. So in order to figure out what the loan to value percentage is, folks, um, <clears throat> we need to divide the little number by the big number. In other words, this is what it's worth today. And this is what the loan is. So in order to come up with the loan to value ratio, we divide this by this 
and we're and we're magically come up with 45 percent loan to value ratio in other words how much of this number does this represent it's not a hundred percent if it was a hundred percent it'd be 260 okay so it's going to be lower than a hundred percent <clears throat> it's even going to be lower than the 70 percent <clears throat> loan to value ratio we figured out they had when they when they first bought the home so actually because of the increase in value of the home and the decrease in the principal amount on the loan they have a 45 percent loan to value ratio i'm sorry did you have a question or were you speaking to someone else i i didn't get the question Okay, I think he's talking to someone in the house. Okay, um, all right. So what happened? What happens is that's how you come up with this. Okay, that's how you figure the loan to value ratio. The, the, the point is, which banker feels more secure? The one that did the original loan? Yeah, you because know, he put, he put, um, he, you know, or, or the current lender. And, and this probably is the same lender. But as you go in time, and as you stay in the home and pay that loan down and house, housing you know, values actually go up, uh, then the lender becomes much more secure, you know, because you're not gonna let that sucker go. I mean, if, if you got in trouble financially, you're gonna call your favorite realtor and throw this on the market um, you know, if it's worth 260 <laughs> today, you probably get get 285 for it. But if it's worth 260, uh, you might put it on the market. You need to turn it quickly at 260, or you might put it up for even 250, and take all that equity out of it and boogie on out of town. You know, I mean, if if you get in trouble, and the lenders know this, they know the longer you stay in that home and the more you pay it down you know, the safer they are that you're going to pay that loan off instead of defaulting and just disappearing in the night. <clears throat> or if you do disappear in the night, they'll just foreclose on it. And they, they're, they're looking at making a, you know, they're, they're not going to lose money on that house. Okay. So that's why larger down payments make loans easier to get. Okay. Or if you get to a point in life where you're just paying cash for things, you don't need the dumb loan, okay? <laughs> okay, and that, that makes it fun too. All right, let's look at mortgages now. Um, an investor purchases a fourplex for 550. They, they, they wanna sell it as soon as they realize a 20% gain. Uh, at what price do they hope to sell the property? Okay, if they bought it, oh, that's a, is, Yeah, if they bought it for five hundred and fifty thousand, this was their purchase price, five fifty. They want to make twenty percent. Do they want all this back? Uh, say yes. <laughs> yeah, they paid that. They want it all back, don't they? Right? Yes or no? Yes. Of course yes. they do. <laughs> so uh, they want it all back. So. Uh, they want all this, which is 100%, plus they want to make a 20% profit. Are you with me? So they, they want to know what price would it be for me to get all my money back plus a 20% profit? Well, that's 120%. Okay, so to figure this one out, um, we're going to take the 550 real simple, times 1.20, that's the decimal equivalent, or if you're gonna use your percent key, you can do 120%, okay? And that means it's gonna, when it gets up to $660,000, uh, then they can, uh, you know, it's time to go back and list it for them, <laughs> okay? Because what they said, well, when it gets to be a 20%, you know, we want to do it. Now, there's other things, you know, this is for the test. There's other things in real life that would factor into this, like, uh, you know, your commission, for instance, and other sales costs. 
Um, so you might want to kick this up, you know, a little bit higher so that they actually clear the 20%. But that's making the question a lot more complicated than it needs to be for the test. Okay. All right, we're going to do one more. And this is going to be a principal interest tax and insurance question. In other words, a PITI payment. PITI, principal interest taxes and insurance. Okay, with me? Most payments are like that. Now, if you're putting down that big down payment, 45%, 50%, whatever, sometimes the lenders will let you take care of your own taxes and insurance. And so there's no escrow for it. So your payment would just be PI or principal and interest. But for the most part, you know, it's just so much more convenient to have all those broken out in the monthly expense because that's kind of how we're paid these days, you know, kind of on a monthly basis. All right, so here's, here's our question. A buyer has a new, a new 40 year loan <laughs> on their home. Wow, that's a big one, uh, a long one anyway. 40 year loan on their new home with a total amount of 480. So it's, it's a decent sized loan as well. Okay, 40 years, wow. Okay, well anyway, um, with a 4% interest rate, 4% interest. Interest, by the way, is always per annum. When you see 4%, per annum means it's per year. And interest on real estate loans is always simple interest. It's not, it's not compounded, it's simple interest. So anyway, 40-year um, loan, 4% interest rate, the taxes are 2,100 bucks. That's, that's pretty close to probably what they would be. And they're currently paying 1500 for insurance. 1500 Now, are these annual or are they monthly costs? Well, I hope the taxes are 2100 bucks a month or the insurance. These are, <clears throat> these are per year. They're annual. Okay. Um, what would the balance be after they make their first payment? Okay. And you look at this and say, oh, wait a minute, Roller, you said I, I, you know, that you wouldn't need one of these complicated amortizing calculators. I could just do it with a simple calculator. Yeah, I, yeah, you, you can. I'll show you right now. Okay. So what happens here is um, we are going to figure this out. Now, since these two are annual and we're talking about a monthly payment, are we, what, we're going to make one payment. And we want to know what our loan balance will be at the end of that payment. So we're going to have to divide these by what, guys? Because these are, yeah, 12. Very good. Thank you. We're going to have to divide those by 12. So on the insurance, that's going to come out to, uh, over here, we'll, we'll bring it down over here. That's going to, be, that's going to come out to $125 on, on the taxes, excuse me. And on the insurance, we're going to divide that. Oh, no, that is $125 on insurance. The taxes, that's this one, is going to be uh, $175. So $175 on taxes, sure, it's a little bit more than that. And then $125 on insurance. And um, that's going to make up the, that's going to make up the, you know, on the PITI payment, that's going to be the uh, principal interest. That's going to be the taxes, T here, and I is insurance. You know, PI, TI payment, this is the taxes, and this is the insurance. Okay. You add those together, that's 300 bucks, right? So the combo of those is $300. That's going to be out of whatever the payment is, that's going to be these two portions of, of that payment. Okay. Now, let's talk about. Um, the interest on, on the loan. Um, the loan was $480,000 and the interest rate was 4%. So we're gonna take this times the 4% and we're gonna come up with an, with a, um, uh, an, an annual interest of, uh, I'll put that right here, $19,200. Why? Because this was an annual interest rate. Now, really true math aficionados realize I could have divided this four by 12 and had this you know, smaller decimal 
a equivalent fraction of that and multiply that and get a monthly interest rate. But we're not gonna do it, we're gonna do it this way because it's easier. So 4% times this equals this, $19,200 in interest. Um, but, but that would not take into consideration, you know, we're really not gonna pay that over the whole year because that loan's gonna go down a tiny bit each month. But that, that doesn't matter for us. We only wanna know, the question asks us, what is the loan balance after the first payment? So we know the loan started at this, we know we're making just one payment. We already figured out what the TI was, okay? We know what the interest is now. Okay, the interest was this, but is that, is that, that was interest for the whole year. So we're gonna divide this, right, by 12. And why am I doing that? Because I wanna know on that first payment, how much was that? And that is, comes out to 600 bucks. Okay. What? Yeah. Oh, 1600. Yeah, 1600 bucks. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I thought that was kind of small. All right. So $1,600, okay, is the P. No, $1,600 is the I. Okay. So we don't know what this is. This P is just the portion of the payment that goes against the principal. We don't know what that is. We do know, because they gave it to us in the question, um, that our, our uh, a payment was 2,500 bucks. Okay, because the question said, uh, the taxes are, their first balance after the first payment of 2,500. So if we take the 2,500 of the first payment, and we take off the 300 and we take off the 1600, okay? That's gonna give us the principal amount. You know, you take the, so that's uh, $1,900. That's gonna give us the $600 that I was talking about earlier, okay? So $600 was what went to the principal off the first payment of 2,500 bucks. Made a $2,500 payment and only 600 went against the principal. But it's because of the low interest rate of 4%. Now, if interest rates of one and one and a half and 2%, like we're seeing right now, my gosh, it's give, that's an absolute giveaway. I mean, I've sold homes in 12% interest rate markets. Uh, ouch. Anyway, so what happens is we knew our loan started off at this amount of money, $480,000. And we're, uh, no, that wasn't, what was that? Oh, no, no, that was right. Yeah. So what happens is we're gonna take the $480,000 and subtract the 600 bucks. And that's gonna give us the new principal balance of 47.9 and $400. This is our, that is our new principal balance after the first payment. Now that's a whole lot of work. Um, to come up with that answer. But that answer is absolutely right. The, the great thing about math is, is if, you, if you know your math and you work the problems. And the only way really to do this, folks, is to come back to the school, get more math problems and actually work them. And if you, if you uh, work them, and we have a couple of different math videos if you, you can also watch, you'll find them very helpful, okay? I hope what we did tonight gave you a little bit of taste of what it's gonna be like. It's more than just understanding how to multiply, divide, subtract, you know, and add. You also have to understand how to put the properties down so you can work them, meaning you have to know the formulas and then you have to look for those silly little tricks, like everything on cap rate has to be annual and it has to be NOI. And sometimes the units have to be the same. You know, we're not looking, we're not solving for yards, okay? And Dan has just put the link up now so you can get the answer sheet to this. We appreciate you being here tonight. As always, uh, you're welcome to call me and, uh, and we'll talk uh, about any of the topics that you're concerned about, or even if you wanna do some math problems, we, we could link up. I can get this board out again. We can work some if you'd want to. Happy to help you any way that I can. Rick Roller, 
556-8000. Thanks for being here tonight. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank, Thank you. you, Jan. Thank you, Rick. This was wonderful. I think we got a lot of good tips here. So I appreciate everyone being here and uh, we'll do another review in a couple of weeks. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was wonderful. <laughs>